Good evening and welcome at the Diplomatic Academy, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers on our live stream transmission. Uh, it's day 72 of the war of Russia in Ukraine. We've been discussing in these 72 days a lot of issues around the war. Uh, many of us have been involved in not only analyzing but actively participating in reactions uh, to this war. And let me say personally at the beginning, I fully support any defensive action that we can take uh, in the West against this war of aggression and the way we can support Ukraine. Uh, but here at the moment, we are also we have the task to analyze the situation. And that's why I'm very thankful that Werner Fastlaben and the AIES has invited us to join a discussion about the military lessons and about the global consequences. You may say it's too early. When you are in the midst of a storm, it may look different than after the storm. But I'm sure our panel can already today tell us something about uh, what's happening at this, very, at this very moment. I'm not an expert in any military issues, and maybe our expert will prove me wrong, but my feeling is, one lesson is, conventional war in Europe is still possible, but the outcome is not so clear. It's not clear how, how much of a difference in military power you need to win a conventional war in the 21st century. The global consequences are more familiar, and I guess we will hear a lot about them because um, the famous word of Zeit and Wende, uh, of the end of the post-Cold War order, is all around us. Again, I would be a bit more cautious, I have to say, sitting in the middle of a storm, whether it's really an epochal uh, change that we're uh, experiencing. But a few things seem to me very obvious that the European Union has a chance uh, to position itself as sovereign Europe with much more strength than possibly Mrs. van der Leyen thought when she spoke about the Geopolitical Commission in 2019. Uh, so there's a chance that one of the consequences will be that geopolitics is discussed uh, in a much more realistic way. Uh, and secondly, it's obvious that we have a problem with supply chains, with resources, uh, with how energy comes to, the, to the, all the corners of the world. So there is a return of geoeconomics that we are experiencing. Uh, and here at the Diplomatic Academy just a week ago, we had a discussion with one of those experts who promoted ideas of geoeconomics already quite, quite some time ago. Uh, so the third, if I may, consequence that I see global consequence is the, the least clear also to me. Is it also about universal values? Are we really fighting the West against an authoritarian regime? Here I'm not so sure because first of all, when you listen to the discussions we have regularly here, the, the issue of universal values uh, is very much criticized as uh, maybe, maybe with some bias from the Western side on what universal values really are. Uh, and all our experts are familiar with what I'm talking about. Uh, and secondly, who is fighting this idea of, of universal values? At the moment, it's Russia. So there is one country fighting our ideas of universal values blatantly, obviously. What about the rest? My final word before I pass over to Werner Fasselabend, really as an introduction, is just to think about it. Uh, I feel that the universal system is still quite stable. That may sound very strange in times of war, but still it's working. It's working, and even Russia, to a certain extent, uh, tries to adapt to these sort of universal ideas of a stable system, although they want to see it in a different way. But the system itself looks to me quite stable. But this is just maybe a provocation for our panel 
uh, they should be no, no better than I. I'm just the poor director of the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. Uh, having said all this, I welcome you all. I pass over to our moderator, and I'm thankful that we have this discussion. Werner, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Emil Briggs, thank you very much for your welcome and your introduction. And I also want to welcome everybody here uh, in the room. Of course, uh, we are a very prominent uh, auditory today. And I want to mention a few people. Uh, I'm sure uh, I will forget somebody, some people, as usual, uh, when you try to make a personal greeting. Uh, but I will try it. And I start with an old friend, Alia Aska Soltanie, ambassador. I also want to greet uh, the former ambassadors, Donatus Kirk and Nicholas Horn. Uh, it's for me a real pleasure that uh, General uh, Christian Sigur Kavanak, uh, the president of Stratec, is here, of course. You know, he's one of uh, the people that are occupying themselves with strategic questions very intensively. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me that Ernest Huber, one of our board members, uh, is here, and Professor Mikhailievich Martin Kreitner. And I just want uh, one person just to stand up because he is a new function. It is Dr. Krauchenberg, he's the new boss of IDM. Uh, he is the successor uh, of, of uh, Erhard Busek in this function, as far as I know. Is this right? Okay. 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 Okay, so uh, I want to, to stop my list over here. And of course, I want to welcome uh, especially warmly uh, our uh, three speakers of today, and I start, will start with the first speaker because he will concentrate, of course, on the military questions. And uh, this is Major General Bruno Günther Hofbauer. Hartly welcome. <clears throat> Maybe I say a few words to him because he will be the first uh, speaker. Of course, uh, yeah, he was born in Graz in 1967. He made a typical military career, uh, visited military academy in Wiener Neustadt, uh, but afterwards also uh, the general staff course and uh, very soon also was used uh, in the ministry and in the planning staffs in different functions. He also joined uh, the NATO headquarters in Brussels, but he also uh, was a commander, not only in Austria, but also in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and he is now the Director General for National Defense and National Cap Capabilities within the ministry. And insofar, uh, he is the responsible man, as we call it, for Grundsatzplanung of uh, the Austrian Bundeswehr. Hartley, welcome to you. Uh, after him, uh, we will continue with Ambassador Lene. I will say a few words before he will start. I think many uh, people out of this auditory uh, would know him. And last, but certainly not least, it will be Professor uh, Schwierzig Weigelin, uh, who will join us and, of course, uh, those two speakers will concentrate on the global consequences, not only the Western side, but also the Chinese side, in order to learn uh, about the discussion uh, in China and in other countries, and also to have different perspectives. And then if time, little time is left, we also should go into a few uh, questions and answers, uh, if you allow. Okay. This is my introduction. I do not want to say more, maybe uh, shortly afterwards. And I would ask uh, Bruno Hofbauer to, to start with his presentation. 
you will do it from here or from over there, it's okay. Uh, I will stay here if uh, this okay. is fine with you. Um, Dr. Faslamt, uh, ladies, gentlemen, your excellencies, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here and for the nice and kind introduction. In the next uh, few minutes, I would like to bring a few points from the military perspective on the Ukrainian war. Um, uh, and we should be clear uh, from the Austrian perspective that uh, distances make a, dis a difference. The distances uh, to the war zone uh, in Ukraine is not further away uh, than Brest. Uh, Kiev is not further away than Paris. And uh, Lviv, Lemberg, as we call it, I can't, uh, uh, can't pronounce it properly. Uh, me. Here is not further away than the Bodensee. So the war has returned to Europe. The conventional war, not a war somewhere in Africa, in the Lebanon, in Syria, you name it. It's back in Europe. And it's not um, a, a civil war as we have seen it in the Balkans. It's a conventional war between two nations using conventional military means. And uh, for the military, it is always interesting to have a look at the geography. And if you uh, take a look at the map on the, on the slide, you can see that Ukraine might not be that flat, open country as it might uh, be expected. These are some parts of Ukraine. As, and as you can see it, especially in the south, there we have open terrain. And that ex uh, this, ex this explains also why the Russian forces had, in the early phase of their, op their op operations, quite a success there. Whereas in the eastern part, where we have the Donbas and uh, Kharkiv and all the area where the fighting is going on at the moment, we have a structured area with many rivers, villages, small cities. So this is, very, uh, this is an area where it's not too easy to do uh, maneuver warfare. Looking at the current situation, it might also be necessary to go some steps back and have a look at what happened before. 2014. Um, in 2014, Russia annexed the Crimea and supported uh, the separation of Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, we in the West were watching what was going on there. We were confronted with an example of what we call hybrid warfare, where we, where we bring, where we achieve a military goal or a political goal without uh, fighting by using all the means that are available. And in the end, you just have a fate of accompli. And in the end, Russia took over the Crimea without any fighting. And this might, might have led also to a somehow wrong perspective uh, per perception of the situation in uh, this war that we are currently observing. In 2014, also something that we should re recognize, we had a similar movement of Russian troops uh, to the Ukrainian border. So in, already in 2014, huge amount of Russian troops were moved to the west. Um, and this was all maybe part of a huge plan to uh, confront us with the situation that Russia is able to do strategic and operational deployment. And this was all observed by us in the West. And then in 2021, it all started. The deployment of the Russian troops started in March. Hiding in plain sight, they moved their troops uh, into the direction of uh, the western parts of Russia, and uh, what happened there, they made exercises. Not a big surprise. This is a playbook situation if you do a deployment of troops. And they left the equipment and sent the troops home. This was in springtime. In the September, the big exercise, Sapat 21. The next step, so the second phase started. More troops, more equipment, and more troops that went home again. And then, in December, um, the whole situation uh, became really uh, dramatic. Also on the political level, uh, the American side, or the, the United States, 
provide, started to provide intelligence reports on the movements. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, satellite pictures with uh, very good, good, with very high quality, um, where we could see also the, the public and uh, everybody who was interested what was going on there. And uh, in the end, those troops did not go home anymore. And uh, they stayed. And then, in, in February, we had the exercise uh, Union Courage in Belarus. Why is that important? Because the, the Russian troops stayed also in Belarus. And this is also something that we need to consider when we look into the future, that now Russia has uh, troops again stationed in Belarus, which was not the case on a permanent basis before. Um, we also need to address the issue that all the confidence-building measures were not working at that time anymore. There were no observers uh, at those exercises that uh, could have been invited. And there, was, uh, there were lots of statements stating that this is not something that is uh, directed against anyone. It's just an exercise. Until 22nd of February, uh, 21st of February, the speech of uh, President Putin. Um, and the signs for military action became very clear then. I was uh, stunned watching Putin at this uh, speech because he was very open in what they were doing, uh, but nobody believed until two days later. And uh, the same day, the recognition of Lugansk and Donetsk uh, the republics were broadcasted. Um, and uh, this was a really interesting show on the TV to see how this was uh, done. And uh, at the same time, uh, Russian troops were ordered to deploy into the Donbas for a so-called uh, peacekeeping operation. The Ukrainian president mobilized his armed forces. Two days later, three days later, 24th of February, the second speech of Vladimir Putin, um, there he launched the special military operation. Um, if you have read what is uh, highlighted on the slide, we see that he made a big narrative that Ukraine is not a state of its own. And the denazification came in again, the role of the West, the role of NATO, and the nuclear thing was also discussed already in this speech. What was also surprising, the Ukraine ordered the general mobilization. What happened there is more or less uh, known. The operation started. I would uh, like to highlight this. This was, the in this was an airborne assault intended to the Hostomel, the Antonov airfield uh, near Kiev, um, with the intention to make a decapitation attack. In the end, to get grip of the, of the capital, to get grip of the political leadership, and to achieve quick victory by military means. But the paratroopers were not lucky. The Ukrainians were warned and prepared. So the, um, the paratroopers landed, and the follow-on forces that were already in the big transport planes on their way had to return because the airfield was not uh, able to uh, uh, provide a landing. This is uh, the one thing. And on the other side, for, for the West, it was not only the surprise that, he, that Russia attacked, but the surprise was how they attacked on four areas, from the north, twice from the east, and from the south. And in the south, the, um, they achieved the biggest gains. In the east, they are still fighting here in the Kharkiv area. This is still ongoing. And uh, the, the Ukrainian frontline troops, so the best troops they had, were fixed in the area on the Donbas, where already the situation was ongoing since 2014. And the re Russian attack uh, continued throughout March and April with attack against uh, targets in the depth, against uh, infrastructure, um, and of course, we all know, um, against Kiev. 
Let me put some observation on the, from the military perspective. Um, the first thing is the nuclear threat. On 24th, the war started. On 27th, only four, three days later, the nuclear card was already put on the table. From the military perspective, or from the operational military perspective in the theater, completely unnecessary. But this was a clear sign to the West, stay out of this conflict. The nuclear armed forces were put on a special regime of alert. Of course, this was also a strong message to the Russian side intern, internally. We are confronted with an all-domain war. We see land forces, air forces, also the naval forces being involved in this, uh, in this war, and uh, all the means are put together. But of course, we also have the cyber domain, which is uh, not used to that extent that uh, was expected, and the war on the information front, on which I will come back a little bit later. Surprisingly, the cruiser Moskva was sunk, which is really a surprise, because such a big ship, nearly 200 meters, what is it doing in these coastal waters? It was providing air defense, because it's the only ship in the, in the Black Sea fleet that has those very uh, high sof highly sophisticated air defense assets, and therefore they moved very close for, for such a big ship um, uh, to the coast, and therefore it was sunk. And we have the rumors that another warship was sunk uh, last night. We will see clearer in a few hours, I think. War on the information front. I call it the TikTok war. You can call it also the war that is running over Facebook or Instagram. The information war is something that has a completely new dimension. Of course, the media and the influence on the public opinion played always a huge role, going back to the American Civil War where, where this and, and others. But we have a new dimension. We have uncontrollable public media, um, social media channels that are providing information that are used by both sides. And I would like to highlight him, because he has fi finally found a real role as a leader of a nation. And if it wasn't to him, I would say the war could have gone completely into another direction. And this was only possible by being on air, showing his picture, and keeping the soldiers and the population of the Ukraine on board that the fight needs to go on. And uh, both sides are doing that. This is something a little bit uh, different. International military support for the Ukraine, um, as we have seen, not only the West um, came together for the, from the economic, uh, economic and diplomatic uh, political side, but also from the military side. The support is uh, ongoing as we speak, um, and it's getting more and more. And this is something where cl clearly the United States of America have seen the opportunity and they are doing something. Um, we are talking about 3.7 billion dollars that are already invested into military hardware and economic aid that is going to the Ukraine. Um, and of course, it also shows what the Europeans are able to give. And I do not say want, but are able. Because the stocks are low. And the American stocks are not that low. So let's come to the situation as it is at the moment. Um, after 26th of March, the Russian side decided to, go, to, go, to take their forces back. Um, their plan didn't work, and they had to regroup. It is 1,000 kilom kilometers from here to the combat zone. So it's a long march, and they had to transfer those troops. And those troops were not uh, first grade anymore because they were in combat, and they were um, in to be refurbished with new equipment and new personnel, and they, that takes time. 
Also that explains a little bit why they are moving so slowly. On the other side, from the military side, we are very, very surprised that maneuver warfare, as, as we would have expected from mechanized forces, did not happen. At, le at least not in that way that uh, one would expect. Coming to the end, I would highlight, like to highlight that, from my perspective, the traditional military threats are not gone. So the mechanized forces, the jets, the artillery, this is not gone, but it is supplemented. It is supplemented by new means, by the information war, by cyber, by hypersonic means that are used, and, of course, by rockets. This is the first thing. The second thing is um, that the new means of warfare have risen in their proportion in supporting those old means. So this, the old things did not go away, but the new things come uh, with it. Third, intelligence and reconnaissance. This is what is of the highest importance. Because the Ukrainian side would never, ever be in the, pos in the position to do what they are doing currently without the intelligence and the reconnaissance capabilities that they have and that they are given. Um, and finally, even if we wish away um, war in Central Europe, in Europe, on the world, I think it's just a fact, as you mentioned, and we have to live with it, and uh, we need to be prepared. And I hope that we take the necessary steps at the right time. Thank you very much. Uh, Major General Hof, uh, thank you very much for your very compact and informative uh, presentation that really gave us uh, a clear picture. I would like to add a few things before I do that. I uh, also want to say a word of welcome to General Fritz Weber, uh, who has been occupied with this situation for decades already, I would say. So, uh, in uh, international classifications, you uh, certainly will find very often the expression of, this is Putin's war. And this is also my opinion. It is, or it has been, Putin's war. Because for me, it did not start with the military buildup at the northern and eastern front in Ukraine, but with his historic essay in last July, when he spoke, I don't know, I think about 60 pages and so on, uh, in order uh, to reason why Russians and Ukrainians are just one people, Odin Narod, not realizing or not uh, looking at the realities. And insofar, my classification is, you know, uh, everybody was, or almost everybody was, unprepared for this war. Even Putin himself, because at least he was not very well prepared, because otherwise the whole management of the war would have been in an absolutely different way. The European uh, society and the states certainly were not prepared either. You can discuss whether the Ukrainians were really prepared. I mean, uh, if you look to the uh, statements they gave us immediately before the beginning uh, of the warfare, uh, you could doubt it. But for sure, also the Russian army was not prepared for this war, not sufficiently prepared for this war. Otherwise, it probably would have acted in a different way. What do I mean with not prepared? I mean, if you just look to the fact that until now, after such a disaster and chaos, it is not a declared war. It still is the notion of special military operation. And what does it mean? It also, of course, did mean that the Russian military was not prepared to go into a war, but into some 
military exercise or into some military uh, operation. And how do you want to win a war when even the army is not really uh, full of conviction uh, that it is going into a war and it is not fully prepared? And you could see it, you know, also if you look to some details. I, uh, I take the freedom because I'm not in an official function anymore. <laughs> so far, I can say a few things, you know. Uh, there certainly was no realistic calculation of the elements of every strategy. The question of power, space, and time. I mean, if you look at that, you know, that the invasion came from three sides, as uh, Major General Hofbauer uh, explains to us. That they started a war against a country with more than 600,000 square kilometers, with a size between 150 and at the most 200,000 soldiers, you know, that came from all parts of the country that had not exercised before in reality in a, in a very strong way, okay. Therefore, no wonder there was no immediate strong strike. I mean, if you look, uh, if you make a look into Clausewitz's uh, book, then you would see what really would be necessary to do so. You also could follow the weak logistics. For me, a catastrophe. But of course, an army that maybe is assuming that it's only going into an exercise and not into a war does act in a different way. For sure, it will. There was no battle of combined arms. This was a surprise for me. This was the first thing I learned when I became defense minister, uh, that if you want to win a war, you have uh, <laughs> to look at fighting, uh, fighting a battle of combined arms, air and, and artillery and, and, and uh, ground troops and so on. Because they were well, not well prepared. If you look just to the fact that they had no instrument against the drones, that the tanks, of course, were not ready. They had not taken already the lessons learned in the southern, southern Caucasian area in Nagorno-Karabakh a few weeks before. If you look to the weak performance they had uh, due to the fact of almost perfect visibility, on the ground, from the space, and so on, you only could see preparation certainly was not enough. And in addition to that came for me also the traditional weak points of Russian armies, that is command tactics instead of mission tactics, and also this breaking line between uh, the, the high officers' grades and the planning staffs and the people on the ground, because usually, you know, uh, this, this strong sense of we are one unit and we are fighting together uh, is something, especially in peace times, you hardly will find uh, in the Russian army. And insofar, it was a surprise, but maybe not such a big surprise as many people thought at the beginning that the performance was by far not the performance we could have expected. And the lesson out of it is, of course, as far as I see it, and I speak it out very openly, you know, uh, politically, Russia has lost the war. Economically, Russia has lost the war. And militarily, maybe it has not lost completely, but for sure they have lost their image as a real strong military power. And if you look, you know, to the strong holds of Russia today, which is their size, their military capability and their resources, they will fail at least in two dimensions. Okay, this, this is what I wanted uh, to add from a very private point, just on Russia. And this is also the point where I want now uh, to give over to, to uh, Stefan Lehne. Stefan Lehne certainly is one of uh, the most outstanding Austrian 
diplomat. He's a man uh, born in Innsbruck. Uh, he studied a baby. <laughs> yeah, he studied law at uh, Vienna, but not only uh, in Vienna, but also in the United States at the famous Fletcher School for International uh, Relations. And uh, afterwards, he joined the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he was in different missions. I do not want uh, to talk about all of them. Uh, but he was responsible for European integration within the ministry as one of the most outstanding functions. And he became the political director, really an outstanding political director, I have to say, uh, where he more or less uh, steered Austrian foreign politics. Okay, and then afterwards he joined uh, Carnegie Europe, and this is where he is still working now, and it's my pleasure now to ask him to give us his presentation. Thank you very much for these very kind words, two kind words, actually. I think today uh, the general had the much easier task, because there are lessons to be learned already from the development of the war in the Ukraine. Uh, but to speak about the global consequences of an event that is ongoing and where the outcome is very difficult to see is a lot more challenging. So I, I th think the only thing I can do is to point to certain tendencies and to certain scenarios, and even that will be with quite a lot of speculation. I think one thing one can predict with a lot of confidence, this is a hugely consequential event. You know, it's an event similar to 9-11 maybe, where people will say in 10, 20, 30 years before and after. It is really a game changer. I think that is very clear. One can say this clearly now. The second thing I can say with a certain confidence too, and this is exactly here I agree with you, uh, Russia is very likely to emerge as the big loser. Uh, it has it will emerge, uh, it has hardly any chance to uh, reach its original military objectives at this point. Uh, its military will be very weakened. Uh, economically, it will be devastated. Uh, the IMF predicts that the Russian economy will shrink by 8.5% this year alone, and some people are a lot more skeptical. The kind of business model of, of Russia, of the Putin Russia as a petro state, basically exporting uh, energy for, for most of its state income, will be put into question as everybody else tries to scramble away from Russian supplies. Uh, and the chances to modernize the Russian economy will suffer from the fact that many modern thinking, Western minded people will leave Russia. And as the uh, quality of life in Russia deteriorates. Uh, the regime will depend more and more on repression and on nationalist uh, propaganda, basically, as the so only source of legitimacy going forward. So, Russia will be much weakened, it will be wounded, and it will still be quite dangerous, I would say. I'm a lot less confident if I look at the uh, consequences of the war in the United States of America. Uh, when President Biden took over, he said these famous words, America is back. Hmm? But a few months later, you had the debacle of the botched uh, uh, Kabul evacuation, and uh, the, the American prestige was very badly hurt in this process. But in the following months, I think the, the U.S. recovered and reassumed uh, their traditional leadership. Uh, I think they were outstanding in uh, assessing the situation correctly, much better than any European uh, government. I, I talked to some people in the German defense ministry who said, well, the Americans had kept talking about the impending war, that this is coming, this is coming in February, but in Germany nobody would believe them. So I think they simply knew better, and they used the intelligence in a very proactive and very smart way, basically in a trying <laughs> to, to preempt what was coming. This didn't work, but still it provided a very good warning on, on, on what was uh, going to come. They were very effect effective in working closely with allies, putting together very uh, tough uh, packages of sanctions, 
they took the lead in supplying military support and economic support to the Ukraine. And uh, they generally, I think, uh, re-energized NATO as a defense framework. But not just NATO, I think the whole, whole group of Western democracies, but also Asian democracies, were again looking to the US to provide leadership. But uh, I think there is a lot of uncertainty whether this uh, leadership function is sustainable, actually. And the biggest challenge is internal. The American society is very badly polarized. Uh, it's likely that the Republican Party will take over Congress in the elections in November. And the Republican Party is also well positioned to regain the presidency in 2024. And of course, if Trump comes back or someone si thinking similar to him, America first and then nothing else in the world, then I think the American leadership in confronting Russia and in leading the international community will be much weaker. And the second factor is, of course, that while the war in the Ukraine is very high on the agenda at the moment of the US, to some extent, it's a distraction. The real game is the rivalry with China. This is what's going to determine the kind of power relationships in the next uh, 20, 30 years. And the moment will come inevitably when the US will refocus its attention on China again. And at that time, I guess they will expect the European Union uh, to take the lead in stabilizing the east of the continent. So there is quite a bit of uncertainty on the American role. And this brings me then to the European Union. Um, uh, the high representative said that uh, the TO political Europe was born in February 2022. I must say, personally, I'm not so sure. It's certain, it's true that the EU has acted with some determination and coherence, and that is remarkable. It has uh, contempt uh, the Russian action quite forcefully. It has uh, participated in, in the sanctions, in strong coordination with the United States. It has supplied a lot of economic assistance for the first time in history. It has supplied weapons to, to a country under attack. Uh, uh, and it also received millions of refugees. That is not <laughs> easy for Europe, as we've seen, because there the, are the big divisions uh, on these issues in the past. And this was even more remarkable because the uh, EU traditionally was very much divided on Russia. There were some countries, uh, mostly those of the former Soviet empire, but also others in the north uh, that were quite skeptical and uh, mistrustful of, of, of Moscow. But there was also a group of five, six countries that cultivated very friendly relations uh, with, uh, with Russia through the decades. And, Austria is part of that group, most definitely. I think the fact that it was possible to achieve unity uh, is due to two external factors. The one is that Putin's attack was so aggressive and so offensive that even the greatest Putin versteher, the greatest sympathizers with Russia, had to fall in line. And the second factor was really the outstanding US leadership uh, in this crisis that also helped keeping the, uh, the European Union together. Um, but uh, are we really now a geopolitical actor? I think one can also say that we have returned to the benevolent US hegemony, basically. And I think the real test for the actorness of Europe uh, in geopolitics will come in a crisis when the US is not interested or at a time when the US leadership is not ready to help Europe. And that might come soon after the 4th of November 2024. Uh, the second worry that I have, <laughs> I must say, is that uh, as the horrible pictures from Ukraine sort of become routine, and as the economic cost, the social and economic fallout of the war becomes more apparent and more painful, then you might have a certain kind of fatigue. I was in the coffee house. Uh, two days ago, and I overheard a conversation of two gentlemen sitting on the next table. And they complained about the rise in uh, heating costs, about the uh, food prices going up. And one turned to the other and said, 
I don't understand why Zelensky not, doesn't capitulate finally. <laughs> so, and I'm a bit worried that if the war goes on and if the pain, economic <coughs> pain, goes up, this kind of mindset might, uh, might prevail with many, many people, not just in, in Austria, in, in coffee houses, but across the region. Uh, uh, Mar uh, Mario Draghi uh, made a speech uh, a few weeks ago where he said, do you want peace or do you want the air conditioning running? <laughs> and I think, I'm not sure how this question will be answered in a few months. So I think this is quite, uh, quite an important concern. Uh, when it comes to Asia, I would defer to uh, the professor who knows the situation very well. But I think it's almost the most interesting region uh, because the, the, the reactions are so diverse, basically. Uh, Japan, uh, that has cultivated uh, under Abe a very positive relationship with, uh, with Russia, now moved to an extremely skeptical stance. It's even receiving refugees from Ukraine, which for Japanese uh, society is quite a surprising development. And uh, India, by contrast, uh, uh, it takes a very, very uh, uh, cautious line on this. I think altogether it's quite interesting. I would say that Russia suffered a huge uh, loss of prestige, but it will not be isolated like North Korea. That's quite unlikely. If you look at the UN votes res resolutions, you saw that uh, of uh, 193 countries, 141 uh, uh, condemned the aggression against Ukraine. This shows that the principle of territorial integrity is the real foundation of, of international relations today. And there is hardly any government that really supports one country evading and taking over another. The last time this really happened was uh, when Saddam Hussein attacked uh, uh, Kuwait uh, in the year 1990. So only five countries voted with Russia. Uh, but 35 countries abstained, and the 35 countries represent more than half of mankind. It was China and it was India. And what is more significant even is that uh, only 40 countries so far participate uh, in sanctions against Russia. It's a rather small minority, actually. The great the majority of countries in the global south um, have a lot of bad feelings about the West, about the US. Uh, they attack uh, Europe and the US for double standards because we mobilize when something happens in Europe, but we ignore terrible things that happen in Yemen and many other places. Uh, many feel that this is just the continuation of the traditional Russian-US uh, fight uh, and uh, some blame uh, NATO expansions for, for things that are going on right now. So, Russia will not be, uh, not be isolated, but of course this group of 40 countries, uh, European and Asian democracies, represent uh, a hugely dominating economic and financial bloc. And together they will be capable to curtail uh, Russian opportunities and options quite considerably. I would some people believe that uh, we are seeing a trend towards a new Cold War situation with Russia and China in one block and the Western and Asian democracies on the other side. Personally, I think this is a possible scenario, but not an extremely likely one. Uh, I believe that Russia will be much more dependent on China in the future, but they don't have the same interest. Russia, Putin obviously seems to be very prepared to cut off all economic and other relations with the West, but China would never do so. I think it's much more integrated in the global economy. And also, if you look at the, uh, at the sort of democracies and the allies of the US, they have quite this diverse attitudes when it comes to China. So uh, this kind of Cold War situation is a potential scenario, but not necessarily the most important one. Uh, I think the conflict will have huge impacts uh, when it comes to food supply. Uh, Russia and the UK together supply 25% of cereals in the world. Uh, 
the, now the Ukraine is uh, not in a place where it can export its production. It also has, of course, huge problems planting new uh, grains. Uh, so uh, this, the, the FAO has predicted that this might lead to about 12 million people in the world uh, starving as a direct consequence of this war. Uh, the World Bank says that the food prices that are already quite high will go up 37%, 40%. And this is devastating, particularly for countries in North Africa and in the Middle East, where uh, bread production is heavily subsidized. If there is no money there, this is not just a huge problem of a humanitarian character, but a huge political problem. There might be revolts, there might be events that actually trigger also new migration from these areas. The other big problem there is, is of course, energy. Uh, uh, the EU takes 40% of its gas from, uh, from Russia, the 25% of its oil. Uh, Russia takes 45% of its income from energy exports. And uh, this amounts to, according to the Commission, to about 1 billion a day. And the paradox is because of the rising prices, uh, the income of Russia from energy exports has doubled in the two months that the war started. This is, a, it's of course, an unacceptable situation. And that's why everybody in the West is trying terribly to diversify away from the Russian supplies. But it's very painful and difficult to do. Uh, still, I think most European experts believe that this uh, will lead to rather an acceleration of the energy transition towards uh, renewables with a lot of pain. But I think this will actually be helpful in this regard. But as far as the rest of the world is concerned, the opposite effect is much more likely. If the EU gobbles up all the LNG supplies and if the energy prices go up even further, then many countries will have to rely on coal. And that, of course, is totally counterproductive when it comes to uh, fighting climate change. And uh, Russia itself amounts to, accounts for 5% of global emissions and will do very little to reduce that uh, in, in, in the years to come. Finally, my final word is on the psychological impact of the war. I think as a consequence, uh, the world has become a darker place and a more brutal place. Uh, there will be other authoritarian regimes that are tempted to do the same thing, to basically solve some problems by the use of military force. Uh, and there is a huge loss of trust in rules and in institutions. Uh, just the effects on, on the UN, on the OSCE is really devastated. There's this very famous quote by Tukidides uh, about the dialogue between Athens and Melos. Uh, where he writes that uh, that's the Athenian position basically is the, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. And I think if this mindset becomes again dominant in international relations, then the world is in big trouble. And I think this fundamentally is the biggest reason why Russia must be seen to be not successful in this war. And this must be very clear as an outcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, Stefan, thank you so much for this brilliant analysis, uh, especially in a moment where, of course, so many things still are open, are flowing, and so on. Uh, but I guess you gave us a very clear picture where the scenarios would go. And this certainly will occupy us for quite some time. And one of the most decisive factors, certainly, as you mentioned it already, also will be uh, the relationship between the Western world, between the uh, United States and China, and uh, also this relationship between Russia and China, of course, will change a lot. And insofar, I will now ask Professor Susanne weigelin schwierzig for her presentation. Susanne uh, weigelin schwierzig uh, was not born in Austria. She uh, started her, her really fascinating uh, academic career in Germany, 
in the university in Bonn and in Bochum uh, mainly, but then of course uh, she was a professor and a researcher at so many universities at the world because she not only studied sinology uh, but also uh, political political uh, science and uh, of course some other Eastern Asian languages and uh, well she studied and worked in China, in Beijing, in Hong Kong, in Japan, in America, I don't know where. Uh, it would lead us too much. I guess we'd rather ask her uh, how she is looking uh, at the development because of course everybody has his thesis what will happen in, in China, but most people do not have really profound uh, information. Where is the discussion? Where does it go? What are the tendencies? And insofar, I now want to ask you, Professor, for your presentation, please. Thank you very much, Minister Fasselabend, for this very friendly introduction. I hope you can hear me. I actually put on my... Can you hear me? You should be hearing me. Okay. Um, uh, I will make things really easy and very concrete, because this is the way we do things in China. And so I'm not going to talk about the really big issues, but I'm going to try to understand one thing, which is why is China what it's called neutral in this conflict? So a very, very easy question, and as you see on this first slide, um, which is of course a Chinese uh, slide, um, for China we have this green field in the middle of Europe, which is actually where Russia and Europe cr clash and where the conflict is actually, um, uh, or what the conflict is all about. And it's not only about Ukraine, it's about the structure of the architecture of Europe, the safety uh, architecture of Europe. Um, I'm supposed to push this for the next slide. Right. What's this? How did you do Tinder. this? Okay, okay, so um, let me answer this very easy question about the neutrality of China in order to open the discussion with the audience on the question what does this actually mean for the future of our world. So just um, to make you remember, because maybe you have not been exposed to a lot of um, media coverage on the, um, um, on the attitude of China towards the situation in Ukraine, uh, let me just recapitulate. And we just um, um, heard a little bit about the very complicated situation China is in. So why is China forced to be neutral? in this situation, despite the fact that starting from the first day of the war, the United States declared that China was on the side of Russia. China explained from the first day that it is not on the side of Russia. China, of course, has its own way of explaining this, and unfortunately, it seems that some people around the world are not so acquainted with the Chinese way of putting these things. It was very, very clear from the first, and from the first mention of this war by the Chinese foreign ministry that China was not intending to be solely on the side of the Russia. So how did they put this? Very easy. They said, you know, everything is to be blamed on the Americans, because the Americans actually um, pushed um, NATO to the border of uh, Russia, and Russia saw this as a security threat, and there was no other way for Russia to react to this security threat except for going to war against Ukraine. So this is the first statement, and this is of course the statement that is the reason why everybody says, okay, this is identical with what Putin says. For that reason, we have to see China as being on Russia's side. But unfortunately, we, we did not listen to the second part of the statement. And the second part of the statement was that China is a country that wants the sovereignty and territorial integrity of every country in the world to be safeguarded. This is an implicit criticism of Russia because obviously Russia went into Ukraine and 
harmed the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And only if you take these two statements together, you understand China's position. So why was China actually forced to take this decision? It was not an either-or situation. It was forced to take this decision. And I think it's very, very clear that uh, China has uh, obviously very friendly relations with Russia. Uh, Mr. Putin came to visit uh, his good friend, Mr. Xi Jinping, uh, on the occasion of the opening of the Olympic Games. And they had a wonderful time together and they said that their friendship had no limitations and you know, that they would always do things together. And um, uh, for that reason, of course, um, uh, some people thought that China would be forced to be on the Russian side, but we have to see the other side of the picture, which is that, as a matter of fact, um, China is a very, very close friend of the Ukraine. And it signed a treaty in 2013 worth for the next 25 years to come, which includes that China and Ukraine will both uh, help each other in safeguarding their country's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and that in case of a third party intruding on the two countries' sovereignty and te territorial integrity, they would help each other. And in case for an aggression to happen with nuclear force, China will have to take actions according to the Carter of the UN. So this is a very delicate situation for China, especially as Mr. Putin, as we just heard, already drew the uh, nuclear card only a few days after uh, the war started. So China has to avoid everything to actually have this happen because in case it happens, it will have to take action. And it definitely doesn't want to take action against Russia and it definitely doesn't want to get, um, uh, get involved into a war far away in Europe. And last but not least, uh, I think China made very clear from the very beginning that this war is against China's national interest. So what is China's national interest? At this moment, maybe you have heard that China is in an enormous economic difficulty. And this war is making China's economic difficulties even worse. So they've always said this war has to stop as soon as possible because they are actually in enormous difficulties as a consequence of the war. So if China says, you know, we are neutral, they're not just saying and playing around and, and maybe tomorrow they're going to support Russia. This war, and they have repeated this time and again, and I think we can understand why, is against China's interest. So uh, this is the reason why it, China has tempt, uh, uh, resisted the temptation to, uh, stay, to, to side with Russia. So what has China done so far? I think everybody knows. We just heard um, um, China um, abstained uh, from all the um, uh, US-promoted uh, resolutions in, uh, in, in the UN. Uh, it voted together with Russia and against the US-promoted uh, resolution uh, in the uh, question of suspending Russia from the UN Human Rights Council. And um, it uh, has been very active uh, in providing humanitarian support to Ukraine. And uh, last but not least, it has been going through multiple talks and conversations with um, all major players that have something to say in this conflict. Maybe you might be astonished to hear that, for example, there were extensive and intensive uh, talks between China and the U.S., despite the U.S. always saying that China is siding with Russia, the U.S. is actually talking with China very intensively. Uh, there was um, a meeting between uh, the uh, um, member of the uh, Standing Committee of the Politburo of the Communist Party of China, Yang Jiechi, and uh, the uh, security... Um, uh, uh, how do you say this? Security, security advisor. advisor, yes. A national security advisor um, uh, from the US in Rome. They talked for seven hours. And do you think they talked for seven hours just to exchange things they had known before? Definitely not. They will have talked on something. 
but you will have no media coverage on what they actually talked about. And I think this is one of the ways that China would prefer for these things to happen because it doesn't want to p participate in public uh, polemic about the situation of the war and it wants to act at the backstage. So for a long time, for nearly 70 days of the war, China has been actually uh, sort of, um, uh, has been sort of acting at the backstage and some people say, you know, how come that China is not more active in getting involved into the war? And of course, this is the answer that uh, Global Times, a very uh, outspoken Chinese um, international uh, media is giving us. Of course, why can't China go uh, do more to help put out the fire? Because uh, somebody else is uh, adding fuel to the fire, which is, of course, also an interesting Chinese proverb. So recent developments are really very interesting because I think we are now entering a new phase in which China is moving from the backstage to the front stage. And very interestingly, they're using the instrument of um, interviews with the Ukraine foreign minister, Mr. Kuleba, uh, an interview that was published in China in, on April 29. And of course, they also had to have an interview with the foreign minister of Russia, and which was uh, uh, published one day later. And the interesting thing about the first uh, interview is, and this was hardly reported, I think, outside China, is the fact that uh, the foreign minister of Ukraine um, said and asked China to get active in exerting its influence on Russia to make this war come to an end as soon as possible. And Mr. Lavrov, who was uh, uh, interviewed one day later, didn't give any impression that he wanted to end the war as soon as possible. But for China, it is very, very important that Ukraine, for the first time, openly ask China to get involved. Uh, the U Ukraine foreign minister had uh, several te telephone talks with uh, the Chinese foreign minister, but they never made anything open. And it's now the first time that, the, by this interview, uh, Mr. Kuleba actually openly asked China to get involved. And this is for China the sign that time has come, that it can move from the backstage to the front stage. And um, I think that um, uh, we are going to see China more active uh, in the next uh, days and weeks to come. So is it possible for China to actually become active and um, uh, act as a moderator in, in this war? Um, I think that China would be very interested in acting as a moderator in this war because it would definitely benefit from uh, taking over this position. However, both Russia and the US are not interested in China getting involved into this and they are not interested in China acting as a moderator. The main reason for the US is, of course, that uh, if China acted as a moderator, it would be a totally uncontrollable moderator and it wouldn't leak any information. So we, we see that there are other options like Israel, like Turkey, and Turkey is maybe more interesting for the US than China. Uh, although, of course, we must say that if any country in this world could have any influence on Russia, it would be China and not be Turkey and not be Israel. But, uh, of course, um, for the U.S., this is not a very good uh, solution. However, Russia is also not interested in having China as a moderator in this situation because uh, they think that if they accepted China as a moderator, they would turn out to be a minor in the situation where China is taking over more and more lead over uh, what is going on in comparison to Russia. And um, if you ask me personally, my, uh, my opinion is that one of the reasons why Mr. Putin took this very, very big um, uh, sort of instrument of going into Ukraine rather than doing a small surgical operation, one of the reasons is because he feels that uh, if he doesn't do this, then the world will be divided between China and and the US and the Russians won't be a world power anymore. So he needed this war also to position himself as a world power and to establish a strategic triangle instead of a binary uh, situation in the world. And for that reason, Russia cannot be happy in having China as a moderator. Uh, last but not least, one must say that um, 
uh, uh, both Russia and the US um, also fear that China would use this opportunity of being a moderator in this situation to enhance its um, position in the world and the image of the world has. And China wants to create the image that the rise of China will be a peaceful rise. And if China could bring peace back to, Russia, uh, to Europe by uh, mediating between uh, Russia and, and the Ukraine, then this would definitely have an impact uh, on the international standing of, uh, of Russia and both uh, of China excuse me and both Russia and the US don't want this to happen so the only country which is actually sort of asking China to do something is interestingly the Ukraine but maybe we have to look the, at this very closely because the person who asked China to interfere is the Ukraine foreign minister whereas the president of Ukraine um, is talking about leading the Ukraine to its victory over Russia. And of course, victory over Russia doesn't need a mediator. So if we are thinking about a mediator, we are thinking about a situation where maybe one side is not going to be able to win over the other side. And this is the situation that China is actually uh, kind of waiting for, and this also puts China in a certain dilemma, which a, an artist um, described like this uh, just only a few days ago. So uh, to come to an end, I would like to say that um, um, we have been perceiving of China as being quite inactive. Uh, one of the reasons why we think that China is inactive is because we don't have any media coverage on this. And why don't we have any media coverage on this? Very clear, because neither the US nor Russia wants us to know. And uh, also the Europeans now, as we heard very closely, um, uh, aligned with the US wouldn't say anything that the US doesn't want them to say. So uh, there are other reasons why we don't know a lot about what China is actually doing in terms of taking action, because China is um, active behind the curtain and it is waiting for an opportunity to come. So China would never sort of jump onto the back, uh, front pay, uh, uh, stage and say, you know, here I am, you know, how about taking me as a moderator? They would never do this. They're always waiting for an opportunity to come and they are listening everywhere and they are uh, publishing interviews if they think, you know, that this is maybe one little step from the backstage to the front stage. So what would be a kind of opportunity for China to actually st uh, step in? Um, I just said the time is not ripe yet, but time could be right, ripe when the ongoing war leads to an exhaustion of both sides, which both sides want to escape from. And according to the military assessment of the situation in China, uh, they actually think that this is the option which is going to come. They don't think that Russia is going to win over Ukraine, and they also don't think that Ukraine is winning over Russia. But we are going into an exhaustion war that can uh, go on for months and years and years, as uh, the US side has already informed us. And China knows from the Korean War that sooner or later the situation will come when both sides are so exhausted that they will ask for a country to act as a moderator. This will be according, I, as far as I understand this Chinese situation, this is what they're waiting for. But of course, uh, we could also say that there is a possibility that, for example, one country approaches victory and then the other country will avoid being actually um, uh, forced into capitulation. And in this situation, actually ask for a moderation and then China could step uh, in. And uh, I think it, uh, it's very interesting to see how, for example, the US needed China in the Vietnam War as a third party at the time, not as a moderator, but as a hidden third party in order to be able to end the Vietnam War. This is a very interesting constellation because the US was waiting for defeat. It knew that the defeat would come and China actually saved the US from total defeat by talking the Vietnamese into ending the war. And uh, the second option, of course, would be, and I think this is also something that is being discussed in China, that we will have enormous instability worldwide because of the economic implications of the war. We just heard about this. And that in this situation, actually, the West will ask for a moderator because the, the consequences for all of our countries 
uh, including the countries in the global south and the countries in the, uh, in the west, could be so <coughs> devastating that the west will ask for this war to finally be ended and then need China to end the war. And I think this is the constellation that we are having at this moment, and we'll see what option will arise. Thank you very much. Yeah, Professor, thank you so much for your profound analysis. And I think, you know, uh, all the three speakers do not only deserve uh, a big hand, but of course, you will also want to use this uh, almost unique opportunity to have such a competent forum in military and political uh, questions to ask a few questions. And therefore, uh, I immediately want to ask uh, the auditory now, are there any questions you want to ask? Oh, oh, many, okay. <laughs> so I start over here. Yes, please. And then I will switch a little. Please uh, tell us your name very shortly and short questions, no comments. We do not want additional speakers. Yes. Is it all right if I ask two questions? Yeah, okay. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Daniel Gombosch. I'm a student at the University of Vienna, a Sinology student of, uh, for Professor. Um, I wanted to ask for Professor specifically because uh, you said China as a role of a moderator. Um, what about India also maybe as a moderator? I see that maybe uh, India is positioning itself uh, to match that role. And uh, when, as I um, have you here, Mr. Hofbauer, um, very, it's a pleasure. Um, I wanted to ask you and maybe all the panelists, how do you assess the rumor uh, that the war will end or reach an end or maybe like a high point on V-Day, on Victory Day? Okay, thank you. We stay in this row, yeah, the neighbor maybe. Um, my name is Andreas Grassel. Uh, I'm one of these quoted TikTok journalists, so <laughs> that's my profession. And my question is going for um, Mrs. Weigelin. Um, it, it is split in two, if that is okay. Uh, first one would be you've quoted um, this treaty that China has signed with uh, Ukraine back in 2013. Now, the leadership has changed several times in Ukraine, and if I remember correctly, 2000, uh, 2013, has been a time where Russia has been friendly to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that there are several changes that happened in between would change anything to China honoring this treaty if it comes from push to shove? And then uh, secondly, um, yeah, I think I've, I've packed it all in one. I intended to, but I okay. think it's good. Okay. So now we have a lady in the last row. Lady in the last row. Mm. Yeah. My name is Gertrude Oelmark, and I have a question for the Major General Hofbauer. How likely do you think is that the Russian will use nuclear weapons in this war? Okay, and last but not least, of course, yeah. yeah welcome to Felling is my name. Um, I worked uh, for years as a development consultant in Ukraine. My question shortly about NATO enlargement, uh, the consequence of uh, Finland and Sweden now uh, considering NATO enlargement. Is it also possible for Austria to join and uh, how you see NATO enlargement as a response to the aggression? And one short question about China. We have this uh, CHI agreement, the trade agreement in the European Parliament ready. Do you think the European Union should adopt this now and offer it to China as a kind of a bridge uh, to make peace uh, in this uh, war? Okay, maybe, uh, yeah, we take one more question immediately over there and then my name is uh, Sebastian Hompert. <laughs> I'm a PhD candidate of Sinology at the University of Vienna, supervised by Professor Weigel in Schwitzig. And uh, I would like to ask a question, actually more or less the same as the last question. So what a possible enlargement with uh, Finland and Sweden would uh, mean uh, militarily, diplomatically? Would it lead to more stability or more instability in the long term? And uh, what would be China's reaction to it? Okay. Okay, so uh, may I ask now 
our three speakers. I guess the first question was for Professor, uh, and then okay. uh, Major General, and then Ambassador. Okay, I think I'm sort of the Asia speci specialist, so I'm supposed to say something about India. And as you know, you know, if you're a sinologist, uh, you have a certain image of India, which includes that India is a wonderful country, however, it's not very good in diplomatic affairs. So, uh, <laughs> from a Chinese point of view, um, you would never give the, uh, the, the task to, <laughs> to, of moderator to India because you don't believe in their diplomatic capabilities. So, of course, I'm not a Chinese, I am a European, and I must say that um, uh, it is very interesting to see how India is trying to take a neutral position in this, um, uh, in this uh, whole conflict, but I think it is also very clear, and uh, during his last visit to Germany, I think the Prime Minister of uh, India has made this very clear, that India is actually taking a neutral position because of its um, uh, national interest. So it's not looking at the uh, broader picture of um, what this uh, conflict means for the world at large, but it is looking what the conflict means for, uh, for India. And I think this is not the very good co condition for a moderator's position. Um, and especially as, um, uh, you, uh, as uh, uh, India is regarded by Russia as a country that is minor to Russia, so it cannot exert any influence on, on Russia. So for that reason, I think that maybe India is not such a very, very good um, idea. Uh, there was another question on China. That was... The free trade agreement with China, yeah. Very interesting question. The other day I had an intensive discussion with uh, Ambassador Schweiz Schweizgut on this, and he said, you know, it's very interesting because, um, as a matter of fact, the treaty itself is really good, and the treaty is uh, good because it's good for both sides. It's good for China, it's good for Europe, and it's only because of the special geopolitical situation that the treaty was actually not um, ratified by the European uh, Parliament. Uh, from my point of view, I would say that under the given situation, the worst thing that can happen is that we drive Russia into China's arms and that we drive China into Russia's arms. So the most important thing we could do as Europeans is driving a wedge between China and Russia and, um, uh, and actually making this treaty become effective would be a very, very, very efficient first step to drive a wedge between China and Russia. For that reason, I, I would say this would be a very, very wise step to take. Okay, thank you. Major General? Well, first, uh, about the, uh, on the question about the Victory Day on Monday. Um, well, well, I do not think that the war will stop uh, after that. Um, of course, the Russian side will uh, do a parade and they will show to the world, but predominantly to the Russian people, that they have achieved some kind of victory. And uh, from the Ru Russian perspective, it would be very helpful if Mariupol would finally fall. Um, because we should not forget they have achieved a lot. They have uh, a land bridge from the Crimea to uh, Luhansk, Donetsk region, they are in the position to do their a new political um, uh, state. Um, I, from my perspective, I expect that there will be some uh, questioning of the people and they will say, yes, we go to, we join you and uh, they will have uh, the Crimea, they will have the, the the control of the Dnepr, which is also very important for the, uh, for the trade inside Ukraine. They have the water for the Crimean uh, with the uh, access to the Northern Krim uh, Canal. And the whole land uh, in the south, the whole Azov, um, Azov Sea is now a Russian sea. So they can finally say, we have uh, achieved something, we are victorious. And uh, so uh, this is what, what I, I think uh, that will come, but the war will not end with that. I think we will go in a, in, into a long period of uh, a, fr a frozen conflict on the political level, but a military conflict, as we have seen it since uh, 2014, 2015, uh, in the Donbas region with uh, 
enemies uh, on both sides of the of the of the lines that are now uh, being created. Um, for the question of uh, nuclear weapons use, a tough question. Um, of course, I cannot see into the future, but normally we expect uh, the Russian side or every nuclear uh, power to uh, be rational and. Uh, be clear about the consequences uh, that, that they might face. Um, we need to separate first the one thing, the street strategic nuclear weapons, which are those uh, intercontinental uh, rockets um, that are really there to destroy Earth, if we, if we put it bluntly. Yeah? On the other side, we have tactical nuclear weapons, uh, but also tactical nuclear weapons are something like Hiroshima. So this is still very dangerous. And uh, the question is, where and why would they deploy it? From my perspective, there is no reason to do it now, as long as the Russian side will not lose. Um, so if we see a very um, tough response from the Ukrainian in uh, going against the Russians and taking back uh, areas they have already um, conquered, I do not rule out that something like that could happen. Okay, thank you. Ambassador? Thank you. Uh, just two points. Uh, one on what will happen on Monday. <laughs> I think only uh, Mr. Putin really knows. There are basically two versions that are sort of being spread around by the media. One is that he would go for a general mobilization uh, and basically, in a way, escalate uh, the war. And the other one is that he would, in fact, uh, declare victory and, and move towards sort of downscaling or slowing down and uh, coming to effective standstill in a few uh, weeks. I think the first one is less likely than the second. The second, I think I would agree with the general. He, I don't think he's achieved what he really the minimum that he needs to achieve at this point, because the progress in the Donetsk is extremely slow at this stage. So I think the most likely thing is that the war, he will declare victory or, or successes, but the war will go on. But it will probably come to some slow down in the next two, three weeks because of the uh, army's strength is exhausted and it will limit the point where it's very, very difficult to go on. But it will slow down. I, I, don't even think that the ceasefire is really realistic at this stage. And I think as long as Putin is in charge, he will not give up the hope of eventually dominating the Ukraine. And a real peace is, I think, out of reach. The second point is on uh, Sweden and uh, Finland joining uh, NATO and what that means or could mean for Austria. Well, I would say if you invite the security expert from Mars to come to Austria and to look at exactly the security situation in Europe and to propose a new security policy for Austria, I think this expert from Mars would probably not come with the idea that <laughs> Austria should be neutral, right? Because probably after careful study, he will say, well, you are integrated in the European Union, you're totally dependent basically on the internal market, on the mutual support, why don't you also join sort of integ military integration? It would be the logical thing. But when this expert from Mars uh, proposes his study in Vienna, he will be chased away. <laughs> 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 because basically there are three main differences between Sweden and, and Finland and Austria. The first one is they perceive a real threat from the Russian side. They are much more exposed than Austria in Austria, there is no sense of a real threat. I think I've not, not, not met anyone who believes that uh, Austria is threatened by Russia. There are people who are worried about nuclear war, but I think NATO membership doesn't protect against nuclear war. Uh, the second thing is Sweden and Finland have always taken military security very seriously. They have invested a lot in this. They are already very closely cooperating uh, with uh, NATO. And the third big difference is, of course, that uh, Finland and Sweden are no longer neutral. I think since the big changes of 89, they call themselves not neutral, but non-aligned, not being part of the military. There are, not, there are no legal constraints on their policy. They can do what they want. 
They have no constitution that uh, outlaws uh, joining NATO. And, of course, also this non-military membership is not so, so sort of ingrained in Finnish and Swedish uh, society. In, in Austria, this is part of our identity, has, has been made part of our identity. It is associated with the success story of Austria uh, since 1955. Uh, and, and I think the last person, the politician who has carefully began to think about possibly changing this policy was Wolfgang Schüssel, and he got cold feet very soon. And I think I saw a poll today that 75% of Austrians are for, uh, against joining NATO, and I would be hugely surprised if an Austrian politician would uh, actually stand up and say, well, time has come to look reality in its face, and we need to do something about it. So I think even Ireland will join NATO before Austria does. <laughs> okay. Just one uh, short remark to the question of uh, India, because uh, AIS uh, is the only Austrian institution that also has permanent relations, academic relations with Indian institutions and uh, is participating every year at the so-called Raisina Dialogue, which is the most important security conference in India. And insofar, we occupied ourselves a little bit with, uh, of course, also this question. You can say there is uh, a deep, long-time relationship between Russia and India that goes far beyond normal relationships. This is one thing. The second one is that the, there are even similarities. For example, in the economy, uh, India still has not really a market economy, but uh, in, in big parts, uh, a socialist state uh, system. You know, this is one of the reasons why India is not so extremely successful. But this is something else. And the third, and maybe the most important question, of course, is if you just make a short look at the map from the Indian position, of course, Russia is the only actor on the continent that could become a partner in the rivalry uh, with China. And insofar, India never will forget its uh, geopolitical situation, you know. They, they uh, also will not follow Western uh, politics, even if there are many similarities and, and, and growing common interests on the security side. Uh, I would say what uh, was, was usual, you know, in Kissinger time when, when people were talking who will play the Chinese card and I don't know uh, who answered it, only China will play the Chinese card. I also would say nobody will play the Indian card, only the Indians will play the Indish card. This is my personal opinion. So now we have another short round of questions, please, over there. Yeah. Ladies um, first. I haven't forgot you. I'm going to answer your question in a minute. <laughs> ah. Thank you so much. Astrid Schneider, my name. I have uh, two questions. The one is, uh, why is the Budapest Memorandum so less discussed in the public, where United States and Great Britain and even Russia promise to protect the territorial integrity of Ukraine? And uh, the second one, um, is it correct that Russia now declared they want the, all the Black Sea coast and do you think they will go to Transnistria, to Moldavia, and maybe then up to White Russia? Or do you think they want all Ukraine? Will they stop before? Thank you so much. No, the gentleman in front of her. No. Thank you. My name is Omar Yunus. I'm a doctoral student with the University of Vienna. My question is probably directed to uh, Herr Dr. Lehne. Uh, you did mention that um, there's a possibility of Republican taking back power in the U.S. soon this year, in, on, in November. Yes. Um, what would you say would be a proper way for European powers to anticipate such a possibility taking place? 
in the near future at least. Thank you. Yeah, are there any more questions over there? Yeah, there is one over here in the middle. Good evening, my name is David Schmoller, study here in the DLG program. Um, this might be a far-fetched question, but do you think if Russia loses this war, really loses it, um, that the Russian territorial integrity is threatened, for example, in the Caucasus or in the Amo region vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? Uh, can you think of that? Is that possible? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ambassador in the first row. Given the fact that we are facing and uh, the situation that it was served, uh, many were surprised. If we are turning back to his time and asked European if the NATO should be expanded or Russia will be provoked because there might be some consequences, if we were able to anticipate what would be the expect, what would be the answer if this question was passed or address to European Union or the officials at that time, assuming that what will happen as we have now witnessing now. Thank you. And there's the lady over there. Over th Um, my name is Sabrina Kaschowitz. I'm also a student at the Diplomatic Academy. And I have a question to Major General uh, Hofbauer. You said that your, in your presentation at the beginning that uh, when Russia was conducting the trainings with Belarus as well, that um, there were no observers um, that were possible to come anymore. So I was asking what happened to, for example, the, um, security and the confidence and security building missions uh, under the Vienna document of the OSCE, for example. If you could elaborate on that, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, maybe there is this side we will mm -hmm. add and uh, also close afterwards. Yes? My name, is, my name is Roman Lahodinsky. I'm a geologist. I'm working in Central Asia still. And um, thousands of young Russians are going there to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and so on. Does this have uh, a serious effect for ending the war? Okay. Neighbor. Hi, my name is Ivan Stanisaljevic and I'm a student at the University of Vienna and I wanted to pose the question to all three panelists. What is, uh, what is the chance of a spillover effect in Transnistria and what is the likeliness of Transnistria experiencing independence? Okay, yeah, and same row. My name is Heinz Kumpf. I have a question to General Hofbauer. Um, we have heard that uh, Russia doesn't declare or doesn't speak about the war. They speak about special operations. They might have an impact because what would happen if really Russia declares war to Ukraine? Is this expectable and what would be the consequences out of the situation right now? Okay. Thank you. Uh, very last question over there and then we finish the speaker's list. How's, my name is Colin Monroe, former British ambassador to the OSCE. How seriously do you rate the risk of spillover in the Balkans? We read these days that there's a considerable instability in Bosnia, and Vucic is a great friend of Putin. Okay. So far, I would like now uh, to ask our speakers, and I also would like uh, to ask you just to give a more or less final statement from your side uh, to this round, because afterwards uh, we would like to have maybe also to drink a glass of wine and ask more questions and talk about what we have learned uh, tonight. Okay, please, uh, Major General. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to, to wrap up some of the questions uh, all, all together because uh, the question on what, what does Russia want? Do they want uh, the whole of Ukraine? Is there a risk of spilling over? And what is about the NATO thing in, uh, in the, uh, with Finland and Sweden? Uh, let, let me uh, share some thoughts on that. First, um, we have if Sweden and Finland 
join NATO, a completely new situation on the NATO northern flank. The change, the, the change is really huge and it has a strong impact on the security feeling of Russia because Finland was always a part of uh, some kind of new, neutral, rather Russia-friendly uh, nation. Um, looking back to their history, they always tried to keep them at distance and uh, my Finnish colleagues also in the high times of everybody was very happy and uh, friend friendly within Europe, always said, for us, nothing has changed, even in the 2000s. So if they change uh, NATO, uh, or join NATO, NATO comes from the Russian perspective extremely close to uh, St. Petersburg and to the Kola Peninsula. And the Kola Peninsula is of utmost importance for their strategic nuclear deterrence. This is something that we uh, in Austria hardly discuss at all. Many of those questions that, or, or point, points that were brought up today are directly related to the question of nuclear deterrence. Because what we can see is uh, that one nation says, that comes back to the question I was answering before, I have nuclear weapons and I can do what I want because I know you would not escalate against me. But this is something different with Finland because Finland is so close uh, to those uh, very important bases uh, for, the, for, the Russian, for the Russian side. Um, on the other side, we now have the Russian forces uh, supposedly uh, staying inside Belarus which is, uh, I do not uh, think that they will go home again uh, af after uh, everything will be uh, solved out. And so we also have a new situation with regard to Sweden, Kaliningrad, Belarus and the Baltic states. Um, coming back to the question, what, what would have happened if we, are look, if we, are, if we could change back time and uh, say, we see what is happening now, would we go for the NATO enlargement? <laughs> well, I don't know, but <laughs> I, I guess the Baltic states would be back with Russia again already. That is at least something that would be very likely if the Russian had acted in a similar way as uh, they have acted now. Um, I, don't know what, I don't know when the Russian side really switched, but we uh, should see what happened in Georgia in 2008. So some years later, we have it uh, in, in, the, in the Crimea. Um, spill over to the Balkans. The question of um, getting all the sea access uh, in Ukraine. I think that was for sure one of the war aims to get to, to cut Ukraine or the rest of Ukraine off access to the Black Sea. Because that would link up to those uh, areas, Transnistria, so we would have, a, and, and the, the, the Glass Sea they built would be even broader because Romania, Moldova, Romania being NATO, Moldova, and then some friendly, uh, I don't know what it is, a state or something, uh, an annexed region that gives a security classy against uh, NATO. I think that would have been for sure in the interest of, um, of Russia. Concerning the Balkans, I think that is the last thing for... for no, the, 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 the exercises are still there. Uh, concerning the Balkans, from the Austrian perspective, this is something that we really need to look into very, very closely. Um, I, do, I, I share the points uh, that were brought up that uh, Russia is uh, weakened on the military side, but we should not take that as something that is a victory uh, uh, over Russia. They will go back, the Russians are smart, they will think what happened. We thought they had already made more progress than they have, are showing us at the moment after, after the war in Georgia, for instance, with air land integration. And uh, what I would do to keep the Europeans busy is I would stir, steer 
directly into the Balkans. Bosnia, Republic, Re Republika Srpska, Serbia. There is enough potential to keep the Europeans busy um, uh, without doing too much, too offensively, but uh, supporting some uh, nationalists uh, there. Um, and, and coming back to the question on the, on the exercises, uh, what they did is, where, where was that? Over there. Um, what they did is they, they just declared that this is an exercise that does not involve enough uh, soldiers and not enough uh, of the uh, military material that there must be uh, an observation allowed. So, the estimate of the NATO Secretary General was that there was an exercise of 30,000 troops, and this, of course, would have uh, caused an observation regime. But they said, no, these are not 30,000 troops. These are many small units training together. So you can't observe them all, and so you stay out. Maybe it would have been better, looking back, if they had trained all the 30,000 troops. Um, because that might have helped in uh, doing what uh, Dr. Faslabend said, combined arms maneuver, and this is what we are not seeing. Thank you. Professor, please. Yes, I'm sorry, I missed answering your question uh, about the, the fact that this treaty was signed in 2013 between China and Ukraine and that uh, there have been many changes uh, uh, since the first signing of the treaty. Um, well, interestingly, you have to know that the treaty was actually signed in 2013, but it was only ratified by the National Congress, People's Congress in China in 2015 which is obviously one year later than 2014, when so many things changed in the Ukraine. Um, secondly, I think we should not forget that, there, uh, that China is a very, very close uh, collaborator of Ukraine, and that Ukraine is extremely important for China in developing its uh, capacity to, um, to um, produce arms and uh, to produce air airplanes. So uh, maybe you know that uh, just recently we had a very, very big airplane coming to Serbia, bringing Chinese weapons to Serbia. So this airplane was actually developed um, in collaboration between Ukraine and China. China had itself tried to develop a big military um, transport airplane. It never uh, achieved what it wanted to achieve, and then it started collaborating with engineers from Ukraine and, uh, and they actually managed to, to build this airplane, and uh, now it was shown to us for the first time um, very openly, and that we have three of them actually transporting weapons to, to Serbia. Um, secondly, one should know that the first aircraft carrier of China was bought from the Ukraine, and it was Ukrainian engineers who helped uh, China to modernize this um, aircraft carrier. So this shows that the collaboration between Ukraine and China is not, you know, just uh, something that you don't need to really talk about. It's really, really crucial and fundamental. And it, it is something that is so important for China that China would never do anything against this contract and make, uh, uh, make Ukraine feel sort of mistreated because they need the collaboration with Ukraine, especially when it comes to military um, technical supplies. So, so I think that despite the fact that uh, things have changed a lot in between, I think we can also see from the fact that China actually uses words from the contract when talking about the ongoing crisis that China wants to stick to this contract. And if I make, if I'm allowed to say something sort of in general about this discussion, I think. Um, uh, what we are actually observing at this moment is that everything falls into two categories. So uh, we are either good or bad, we are either on the Russian side or the US side, or we are either on the side of the Ukraine or, the, or Russia. And what is interesting about the Chinese perspective is that they are pushing a third perspective on things. And from my point of view, 
uh, this is something that will come up inevitably. We will not be able to steer Europe through that crisis the way it has been developing during the last 70 days without learning to take a third perspective. And if we look at Sweden and if we look at, uh, at um, Finland um, and if we look at the discussion we just had about the neutrality of Austria, you may allow me as a German uh, to say that I think that we, should keep, uh, that we should have in mind that all countries have security interests. And this implies that if we continue to harm the security interests of Russia, we will have to deal with a long and ongoing war in the middle of Europe that will eventually expand to other places in Europe. Uh, just look at the situation of the Solomon Island. China has just um, signed a treaty with the Solomon Island, and um, people around the world are suspecting for China to develop a military base on the Solomon Island. So the reaction of the U.S. was that its security interests was being uh, harmed by this contract and that the U.S. is willing to take military action if China wants to establish a military base in Solomon Island. So here we see that it is natural for the U.S. to actually um, see when its security, uh, uh, is, uh, security interests are being harmed that it actually shows China, you know what, I don't like this. So maybe we should learn not only to listen to those countries that we like and their security interests, but maybe it is even more important to listen to those countries that we don't like and to take their security interests in consideration. And this would imply, from my point of view, that we would strongly um, uh, vote for a non-expansion of NATO into the north of Europe. Thank you. Stefan? Yeah. Um, I address three questions. One is uh, the impact on the Balkans. Um, there I would say certainly there is an impact. It's a very complicated story. I think Russia has not no ambitions of hegemony in the Balkans. It's much too weak. It doesn't have the resources. It doesn't have much to offer to the region apart from energy. Uh, it was in the last 10 years in some kind of spoiler role. It, uh, after the Kosovo war in particular, it was very antagonistic towards Western ambitions and ideas for the Balkans. And it uses all the leverage it has to make the Western and European agenda more difficult to achieve. And I think this will probably get worse before it gets better. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, the country central to the Balkans, Serbia, will be in a very complicated situation. Uh, Serbia always tried to have several pillars, a strong relationship with Russia, a strong relationship with China, but at the same time candidate to the European Union. Uh, it is not participating in sanctions so far but it will come under very heavy pressure from EU and the US to take sides, basically, on this issue. Because uh, it's, it's felt that it is incompatible with the uh, negotiating accession on the EU and, and ignoring the EU positions on this issue. And I think Vucic, I think, will very carefully, in a very cautious way, move in the Western direction, because really, ultimately, he has no choice. Uh, the second question, uh, briefly, uh, what happens to the EU when uh, the US goes back to Donald <laughs> Trump and <coughs> Trumpism? Well, you've had this very long debate uh, in Europe about strategic autonomy, European sovereignty. Uh, Emmanuel Macron is a strong promoter of this uh, concept. Um, it has run into trouble with countries in Eastern Europe because they think, well, whatever the EU can do in the uh, defense field, we still need the U.S. guarantee and we will not allow anything to happen that would undermine the pre security presence of the United States in Europe. And I think after what happened now, these feelings are even stronger. But if the U.S. Uh, moves in a totally different direction, isolationists, abandoning the alliance, then the moment of truth will come. 
and then uh, Europe will finally have to get its act together and, and push forward in terms of becoming a serious, also military power. That, of course, will complicate the life of Austria, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Final question, the question of the ambassador, how we see uh, NATO enlargement in retrospect. Well, uh, I think if you ask the question to EU member states, such as Poland <laughs> or the Baltic states, the answer will be very clear. They are extremely confirmed <laughs> that this was an absolutely brilliant <laughs> idea of joining, <laughs> joining NATO. And uh, I think when it comes to uh, Sweden and Finland, I take a rather different view from, uh, from the professor. I think it's the sovereign right of each, every country, and this is part of the OSCE documents uh, to choose whether to be part of an alliance or to be part of neutral, uh, or to be neutral. And if these countries <coughs> feel that their, their security is better protected, if they are part of NATO, they have the sovereign right of doing so. And it's perfectly understandable in light of the developments of the last uh, two months that they reach these conclusions. Uh, Finland has for a long time been very happy to be non-aligned, but given what happened, it's understandable that it uh, takes, reaches different conclusions now. As far as Ukraine is concerned, I think NATO enlargement is overrated as a reason for the war that happened. Because basically, in 2008, when the Bucharest uh, summit took place, uh, there was this kind of formal promise that the door is open to these countries, uh, but at the same time it was very clear that the door was shut, because the Germans and the French at this point said very clearly uh, they don't accept any kind of accession procedure for uh, Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova. And, and that, basically the NATO story was finished uh, at this point. I think the, uh, what is the cause of the war is that Putin doesn't accept the statehood of the Ukraine. He thinks it's an invention by Lenin, which is rather curious. And uh, he basically believes that this is a place that should be part of Russia. And the reason why he moved now is not because NATO was getting more involved in this area, but Ukraine, after 2014, because of Putin's action, was becoming more and more Western in its orientation economic orientation in, in many areas, cultural, etc. So uh, he probably thought we still have a chance to bring them back to us. But uh, I guess it was a huge, huge, huge mistake. Thank you. Yeah, before saying a few words also maybe to the Austrian discussion, uh, Sorry. No. The, the, the Budapest. Yeah, I, I can say something briefly about the Budapest. Okay. Well, uh, it just shows that treaties and documents are frequently ignored and put aside. Obviously, what happened is in total contradiction to the Budapest thing, and that I think is one reason why. Some countries prefer to be part of alliance systems because they have to rely on for their security on something a little bit more solid than a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah uh, before saying a few words uh, to the Austrian discussion, uh, maybe I just want, would like to announce uh, our next event. Our next event here will be on Monday the 16th, uh, a presentation of uh, Dr. Mohamed El Baradai on nuclear uh, security or nuclear danger. This will, and uh, next week we will have in our history program a presentation of uh, the director of uh, the uh, of the uh, HGM, the, the uh, Museum. Military Museum, Military History, history Museum in Vienna, in Rastov on the battle of Aspen and Essling, Austria's victory over Napoleon. So <laughs> this will not happen here, okay. but uh, in Rastorf, very close, where the battle has uh, happened, okay. Those are our next events, and uh, maybe at the end, just a short remark. Uh, at the beginning, Stefan Lene uh, mentioned that probably this uh, war in Ukraine 
or not probably, this will be a game changer. And of course also, uh, somehow it will be a game changer for Austria, no question. And I guess the most important question we will have to answer is not the question whether Austria will stay neutral or not, but the most important question will be, what is the right policy in order to secure our security interests and where can we influence it in the best way? Maybe we should concentrate our discussion on these themes and not just start out with a, a systemic question. This is what I would say. And at the very end, I just uh, would like you know, to say a few words also about uh, the war in Ukraine. How long will it last? Of course, nobody can tell. But there is more or less an iron rule for the end of, uh, of wars. A war will end when the two parties either have reached their goal or realize that they cannot reach their goals anymore and the disadvantage of continuing is bigger as the advantage. This is more or less the rule. And insofar, the war, I guess, will not be endless. Maybe we have not reached this point already. Of course, this will be not easy for both sides to answer, but I'm sure it will not be an endless war. And maybe with this uh, positive outlook, uh, I now will end this session. I thank you very much. Please, I want to end with a real big hand for our, present, uh, for our speakers. They really did a phenomenal job. Thank you very, very much. It was a pleasure for me to take part. Thank you.